Welcome to Our Ventura TV. I'm Lynn Fairley, and I have another wonderful guest. Welcome, Claire Burrill. Thank you very much, Lynn. My pleasure to be here. Oh, it's all mine, actually. Welcome. You and I have known each other now for how long? Oh, coming on three, three and a half years now. That's right. And we met through a mutual friend, and that is ultimately Judge Bish. Correct. You teach presently at the Ventura Colleges of Law, correct? Yes, I'm an adjunct professor of constitutional law at the Ventura Colleges of Law. Before we get to constitutional law, which is really, really the nuts and bolts of today's show, let's talk a little bit more about your career because you're also a veteran. Yes, I am. I was accepted into the Navy ROTC scholarship program. I attended Harvard University and graduated there in 1966. And I went into the U.S. Navy for four years in commissioned service. My first two years were in the Far East and uh, Japan and Vietnam and Thailand. And then I came back to the United States and served two years in Charleston, South Carolina. And that's where I married my lovely wife, Denise, and we lived our first two married years in Charleston, South Carolina. What were your duties in the Navy? I was a communications officer on board a ship out of Japan originally. And then when I came back to the States and took my billet in uh, Charleston, I was a staff officer uh, instructor. And then you moved to Cleveland. Uh, no, not quite. Uh, we, we, with our first daughter, Lee, went to Madison, Wisconsin, where I attended law school. Ah. And I spent three years in Madison. I worked for the Attorney General of the state of Wisconsin. And then I took a clerkship one summer at a law firm in Cleveland, Ohio. And eventually we moved to Cleveland. I took my first job with a law firm in Cleveland, Ohio. And then you got into entertainment law, I believe. Yes, well, <clears throat> while I was at Harvard, I, I played in a uh, rock band. It was called Oedipus and His Mothers. Oedipus and His Mothers? <laughs> Oedipus and His Mothers was the rock band that I played in. And one of the, one of the fellows that played in the band with me well, went, uh, went to Harvard as well and also graduated the year before I did and he attended law school at Fordham in New York City. And when I got out of the Navy and went to the uh, law firm in Cleveland, I learned that he was working for an entertainment law firm in New York. And eventually, they established a California office, and he came out to run the California office for the New York law firm. And then he asked me to join him out here in California, and I was always interested in music and the entertainment business, so I. I took him up on it and uh, we moved to uh, California and I started working for that law firm in a California office. So a rock star and a lawyer. Well. Fits for California, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it worked. <laughs> what kind of instrument did you play? I played guitar and uh, originally I played piano. I played the pipe organ in, in the church at my sister's wedding and then I played trombone in the marching band but eventually I went to guitar because there aren't any trombones in rock bands. Uh, well, now there are. Well, yes. But not, not back then. Not back then. Not back then. Uh, now, while you were here in Los Angeles as an entertainment lawyer, I believe you got to meet some pretty amazing people, particularly one of the most special people, and that is Robin Williams. I worked, I worked for Robin Williams uh, for several years. I also was very close to work with John Candy, and I had the pleasure of working with the Rolling Stones, as well as Bill Withers and a few others. That's a lot. That's yeah, a lot. We, we had some wonderful, wonderful clients. Now, because of our recent loss of Robin Williams, can you say something about him that would just be, I don't know, positive and intriguing and, and something our audience might enjoy? What was it like working with him? He was a genius. Mm. He was a very, very sharp, smart individual. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened in his later years. I had nothing to do with him in his later years, but when I was working for Robin, he was just the most incredibly brilliant, quick-minded individual, a great wit and a great mind. Yeah, big loss for us all, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a movie coming out with him in, a, in a, about a week or so. Yes, yeah. he, he, uh, he did quite a few movies before, unfortunately, he uh, mm -hmm. took his life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in entertainment law, what would you do? Because it's quite different from constitution law. That's, that's where I'm going. Why, you, you're so talented yourself. Um, what attracted you to constitution law after entertainment law? But there's another question before that. What did you do in entertainment law that perhaps led to constitution law? Well, <clears throat> most of what we did in, uh, in the entertainment area was work on contracts for individuals that might be in the movies or recording stars, court recording artists, 
and music publishing, and we did a lot of work in copyright, and copyright is a major federal piece of legislation. And I was fascinated with the Constitution when I was in law school. I always thought it was uh, incredible that we have this amazing document that's been in existence now well over 200 years. And we have people who have to interpret it each and every time a, a, a situation comes up involving constitutional rights, we have nine people we rely upon to interpret it for us. And the fascinating thing is uh, there's always several different ways to look at it. Most of the major decisions that come down in constitutional law by the US Supreme Court are five to four. Those are the controversial ones, but that just tells you that the Constitution has two sides. And the important thing is to understand that, that you have to appreciate the fact that there's two sides to every story. Yes, it's been, it's been quite a pleasure to uh, learn as much as I have since I met you, because we do a segment on my radio show, Lynn Fairley and Friends, called Legal Clarity. And you are our official legal beagle who brings clarity to the issues that the many issues that have come up in the Supreme Court uh, since we started uh, a little over three years ago. And they have been plenty and they've been profound and many. We many have, more to come. <clears throat> Absolutely. We have a wonderful time with that show. And uh, legal clarity, my first name is spelled C-L-A-I-R. So my daughter, my, our oldest daughter, Lee, came up with the idea to call the show, or our segment of the show, uh, legal clarity, spelled C-L-A-I-R-I-T-Y. Uh, kind of a little play on words. Yes, it has, but, it, but I've been astonished because I, well, personally, I think I've earned an honorary degree in the Constitution, <laughs> being your worst student there on the show, because I'm the one who's learned the most, I think, in these last three or so years, and our, and our listeners have really appreciated it, too. Every single major thing in my life, having to do with freedom of speech and, and uh, of course, equality and marriage and, and many, many more things. Oh, my gosh, we spoke, we've, from soup to nuts, Gore versus Bush, we've also uh, talked about uh, Citizens United, and we will continue to do it because it just never ends. I thought after a while, boy, when do we run out of topics? That would be never. I don't think the, uh, the only time we'll ever run out of topics is when the Supreme Court runs out of topics, and that's never going to happen. And I was astonished to learn that they are presented with oh, hundreds of cases, but only accept a few. They Can you actually, explain a little bit as to how a case might get to the Supreme Court? There's, a, there's two or three different ways that a case can actually get to the Supreme Court. The most common is called a writ of certiorari. The losing party at the lower court level has the right to petition for a writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court. And if the writ is granted, it takes four justices to grant a writ of certiorari, four out of the nine. If the writ is granted, then their, curse, then their case will be heard. There are thousands of cases where people petition for a writ of certiorari each year, and only 1% is actually heard mm -hmm. and argued before the court. And many of those uh, are decided by a unanimous court. So you might get 50 or 60 a year where we don't even read about them because they're unanimous. Unless, unless you follow the Supreme Court, they wouldn't be in the newspaper. The Whether ones, you're voted nine to zero or eight to one or a unanimous exactly, decision. Exactly, exactly. The ones that we read about, the ones that get in the headlines, are on the most controversial issues that touch all of our lives. Mm -hmm. And those normally come down five, four, six, three, or something like that. And it's not always the same mix. Uh, there are some ideological splits that are predictable on the Supreme Court from time to time. But, uh, but uh, we, we, we always have to watch for the differences because I tell my students, for example, when I teach constitutional law, look, if you saw a particular issue one way and somebody else saw it another way, that doesn't make you wrong because even if, the, if you're just talking about these most uh, important constitutional issues, even if you're on the wrong side, quote unquote, the minority side, you still have four Supreme Court justices who agree with you. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a very exciting thing, I mean, the way these things come It down. is. It's, it's been extremely exciting. And you teach at the Ventura Colleges of Law and occasionally up in Santa Barbara, I believe. I do teach in Santa Barbara. I teach a few electives once in a while. I've been asked to teach uh, entertainment law, for example, every once in a while up at, at Santa Barbara. And uh, I've, been, I've been teaching for about 20 years now, and uh, I've actually taught about nine different courses. 
but I specialize now in constitutional law. That's my favorite. And, and in humor. What's, what's so great about working with you, and I imagine um, being in class with you, and I'd very much like to audit a, a course. One You're of welcome days, to. Is that um, you teach it in plain language, and you teach it with a lot of humor. I think your students must really, really enjoy your classes. What I, what I try to impart to my students is this is a very difficult course. Mm. It's probably, if not the most difficult, one of the most difficult courses you take in law school because it's not hard and fast rules and applying this to a rule and coming out with a decision like in many other courses. Not, not to say the other courses are easy because they're not, but this is a course where you're, you're dealing with important topical issues that touch all of our lives and rights that we all think about. One of the things I say is what comes before the Supreme Court is a collision of rights. Your rights versus my rights. Where, where do my rights leave off and your rights begin? And vice versa. You know, when, when are there things so egregious that I can't say them, even though I have freedom of speech? And we're going to be talking about one of those cases that's coming up at the Supreme Court. Uh, it's already been argued. It won't be decided probably until later in the year. But on our Legal Clarity segment of Lynn Fairley and Friends, we will be talking about this case called Elanis versus the United States. And his question is, when does your freedom of speech cut off and when does it become a threat? Well, I know I wouldn't yell fire in a theater. Right. Uh, that's, for that's, example. That's, exa that's a very good example. You don't yell fire in a crowded theater. But what about just going on the internet and, and making nasty, nasty comments about your ex-wife? When does your freedom of speech cut off and that becomes a threat? Yeah, that'll be fun. I, I look forward to uh, gonna, doing that segment. We're going to talk about that one. Now, you and I got to be, uh, we were very lucky. We were invited to see Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman ever to be on the Supreme Court, elected by Ronald Reagan in 1981 and served for nearly 25 years. Five years. 25 years. Uh, just recently, like just this last month, we were there in her presence. and. Uh, I want you to talk about two things, uh, the highlight of that meeting and also what your message would be for youth today. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, when she was on the court, not only was the first woman, she was a very, very important figure because she could compromise. She could work with justices uh, on both ideological sides of the court and bring them to some sort of middle ground. That was, she was very, very effective at that. What also struck me about her is she has a great sense of humor. And she said, uh, she's, uh, don't mess with me. She's, she's got an attitude that is very, very uh, acceptable because of her position. She also has a website, a nonprofit called iCivics. That's small i like iPad or iPhone iCivics, C-I-V-I-C-S, which is getting people involved in learning about how our government functions, how it's made up, how the Supreme Court works, how the rest of the branches of the government work vis-a-vis -vis each other. And I recommend that you go online to iCivics.com, have your children, your grandchildren go online to iCivics.com. You'll learn a lot about the United States, the government, and the way it works. Yes, I agree with that, and I also enjoyed her company very much, just listening to her speak, which was very short, very short, yes. uh, it was about a 30-minute um, presentation to the public, absolutely hilarious, very inspiring, and a trailblazer, because the rest of the women that are now on the court got there because she did. There's no question about it. She, she started the trend. So for our youth today, please, please get involved in uh, civics and in ethics, and take a look at iCivics.com. Thank you very much for coming on to Arventura TV again. Please stay tuned for some more amazing programming.